Bleak House by Charles Dickens Audiobook 5x65 My young friends are the wards in Yarndus. Yarndus, said the old man with a, star with a start. Yarndus and Yarndus. The great suit, crook, returned his lodger. Hi, exclaimed the old man in a tone of thoughtful amazement and with a wider stare than before. Think of it. He seemed so wrapped all in a moment and looked so curiously at us that Richard said, Why, you appear to trouble yourself a good deal about the causes before your noble and learned brother, the other Chancellor. Yes, said the old man abstractedly. Sure. Your name now will be Richard Carstone. Carstone, he repeated, slowly checking off that name upon his forefinger and each of the others he went on to mention upon a separate finger. Yes. There was the name of Barbary, and the name of Clare, and the name of Didlock, too, I think. He knows as much of the cause as the real salaried Chancellor, said Richard, quite astonished, to Ada and me. I, said the old man, coming slowly out of his abstraction. Yes. Tom Yarndus you'll excuse me, being related, but he was never known about court by any other name, and was as well known there as she is now, nodding slightly at his lodger. Tom Yarndus was often in here. He got into a restless habit of strolling about when the cause was on, or expected, talking to the little shopkeepers and telling them to keep out of chancery, whatever they did. For, says he, it's being ground to bits in a slow mill, it's being roasted at a slow fire, it's being stung to death by single bees, it's being drowned by drops, it's going mad by grains. He was as near making away with himself, just where the young lady stands, as near could be. We listened with horror. He come in at the door, said the old man, slowly pointing an imaginary track along the shop. On the day he did it the whole neighborhood had said for months before that he would do it, of a certainty sooner or later he come in at the door that day, and walked along there, and sat himself on a bench that stood there, and asked me, you'll judge I was a mortal sight younger then, to fetch him a pint of wine. For, says he, crook, I am much depressed, my cause is on again, and I think I'm nearer judgment than I ever was. I hadn't a mind to leave him alone, and I persuaded him to go to the tavern over the way there, t'other side my lane, I mean Chancery Lane, and I followed and looked in at the window, and saw him, comfortable as I thought, in the armchair by the fire, and company with him. I hadn't hardly got back here when I heard a shot go echoing and rattling right away into the inn. I ran out neighbors ran out twenty of us cried at once, Tom Yarndus. The old man stopped, looked hard at us, looked down into the lantern, blew the light out, and shut the lantern up. We were right, I needn't tell the present hearers. Hi. To be sure, how the neighborhood poured into court that afternoon while the cause was on. How my noble and learned brother, and all the rest of them, grubbed and muddled away as usual and tried to look as if they hadn't heard a word of the last fact in the case or as if they had oh, dear me, dash nothing at all to do with it if they had heard of it by any chance. Ada's color had entirely left her, and Richard was scarcely less pale. Nor could I wonder, judging even from my emotions, and I was no party in the suit, that to hearts so untried and fresh it was a shock to come into the inheritance of a protracted misery attended in the minds of many people with such dreadful recollections. I had another uneasiness, in the application of the painful story to the poor half-witted creature who had brought us there, but, to my surprise, she seemed perfectly unconscious of that and only led the way upstairs again, informing us with the toleration of a superior creature for the infirmities of a common mortal that her landlord was a little m, you know. She lived at the top of the house, in a pretty large room, from which she had a glimpse of Lincoln's Inn Hall. This seemed to have been her principal inducement, originally, for taking up her residence there. 
she could look at it, she said, in the night, especially in the moonshine. Her room was clean, but very, very bare. I noticed the scantiest necessaries in the way of furniture, a few old prints from books of chancellors and barristers, wafered against the wall, and some half-dozen reticles and work bags, containing documents, as she informed us. There were neither coals nor ashes in the grate, and I saw no articles of clothing anywhere, nor any kind of food. Upon a shelf in an open cupboard were a plate or two, a cup or two, and so forth, but all dry and empty. There was a more affecting meaning in her pinched appearance, I thought as I looked round, than I had understood before. Extremely honoured, I am sure, said our poor hostess with the greatest suavity, by this visit from the wards in Yarndus. And very much indebted for the omen. It is a retired situation. Considering. I am limited as to situation. In consequence of the necessity of attending on the Chancellor. I have lived here many years. I pass my days in court, my evenings, and my nights here. I find the nights long, for I sleep but little and think much. That is, of course, unavoidable, being in chancery. I am sorry I cannot offer chocolate. I expect a judgment shortly and shall then place my establishment on a superior footing. At present, I don't mind confessing to the wards in Yarndus, in strict confidence, that I sometimes find it difficult to keep up a genteel appearance. I have felt the cold here. I have felt something sharper than cold. It matters very little. Pray excuse the introduction of such mean topics. She partly drew aside the curtain of the long, low garret window and called our attention to a number of bird cages hanging there, some containing several birds. There were larks, linnets, and goldfinches I should think at least twenty. I began to keep the little creatures, she said with an object that the wards will readily comprehend. With the intention of restoring them to liberty. When my judgment should be given. Yet yeah, yes. They die in prison, though. Their lives, poor silly things, are so short in comparison with chancery proceedings that, one by one, the whole collection has died over and over again. I doubt, do you know, whether one of these, though they are all young, will live to be free. Very mortifying, is it not? Although she sometimes asked a question, she never seemed to expect a reply, but rambled on as if she were in the habit of doing so when no one but herself was present. Indeed, she pursued, I positively doubt sometimes, I do assure you, whether while matters are still unsettled, and the sixth or great seal still prevails, I may not one day be found lying stark and senseless here, as I have found so many birds. Richard, answering what he saw in Ada's compassionate eyes, took the opportunity of laying some money, softly and unobserved, on the chimney piece. We all drew nearer to the cages, feigning to examine the birds. I can't allow them to sing much, said the little old lady, for, you'll think this curious. I find my mind confused by the idea that they are singing while I am following the arguments in court. And my mind requires to be so very clear, you know. Another time, I'll tell you their names. Not at present. On a day of such good omen, they shall sing as much as they like. In honor of youth, a smile and curtsy, hope, a smile and curtsy, and beauty, a smile and curtsy. There. We'll let in the full light. The birds began to stir and chirp. I cannot admit the air freely, said the little old lady the room was close, and would have been the better for it because the cat you saw downstairs, called Lady Jane, is greedy for their lives. She crouches on the parapet outside for hours and hours. I have discovered, whispering mysteriously, that her natural cruelty is sharpened by a jealous fear of their regaining their liberty. In consequence of the judgment I expect being shortly given. 
she is sly and full of malice. I half believe, sometimes, that she is no cat, but the wolf of the old saying. It is so very difficult to keep her from the door. Some neighboring bells, reminding the poor soul that it was half past nine, did more for us in the way of bringing our visit to an end than we could easily have done for ourselves. She hurriedly took up her little bag of documents, which she had laid upon the table on coming in, and asked if we were also going into court. On our answering no, and that we would on no account detain her, she opened the door to attend us downstairs. With such an omen, it is even more necessary than usual that I should be there before the Chancellor comes in, said she, for he might mention my case the first thing. I have a presentiment that he will mention it the first thing this morning. She stopped to tell us in a whisper as we were going down that the whole house was filled with strange lumber which her landlord had bought piecemeal and had no wish to sell, in consequence of being a little M. This was on the first floor. But she had made a previous stoppage on the second floor and had silently pointed at a dark door there. The only other lodger, she now whispered in explanation, a law writer. The children in the lanes here say he has sold himself to the devil. I don't know what he can have done with the money. Hush. She appeared to mistrust that the lodger might hear her even there, and repeating hush, went before us on tiptoe as though even the sound of her footsteps might reveal to him what she had said. Passing through the shop on our way out, as we had passed through it on our way in, we found the old man storing a quantity of packets of waste paper in a kind of well in the floor. He seemed to be working hard, with the perspiration standing on his forehead, and had a piece of chalk by him, with which, as he put each separate package or bundle down, he made a crooked mark on the paneling of the wall. Richard and Ada, and Miss Jellyby, and the little old lady had gone by him, and I was going when he touched me on the arm to stay me, and chalked the letter J upon the wall in a very curious manner, beginning with the end of the letter and shaping it backward. It was a capital letter, not a printed one, but just such a letter as any clerk in Messrs. Kench and Carboy's office would have made. Can you read it? he asked me with a keen glance. Surely, said I. It's very plain. What is it? Jay with another glance at me, and a glance at the door, he rubbed it out and turned an A in its place, not a capital letter this time, and said, What's that? I told him. He then rubbed that out and turned the letter R, and asked me the same question. He went on quickly until he had formed in the same curious manner, beginning at the ends and bottoms of the letters, the word Yarndus, without once leaving two letters on the wall together. What does that spell? he asked me. When I told him, he laughed. In the same odd way, yet with the same rapidity, he then produced singly, and rubbed out singly, the letters forming the words Bleak House. These, in some astonishment, I also read, and he laughed again. Hi, said the old man, laying aside the chalk. I have a turn for copying from memory, you see, miss, though I can neither read nor write. He looked so disagreeable and his cat looked so wickedly at me, as if I were a blood relation of the birds upstairs that I was quite relieved by Richard's appearing at the door and saying, Miss Summerson, I hope you are not bargaining for the sale of your hair. Don't be tempted. Three sacks below are quite enough for Mr. Crook. I lost no time in wishing Mr. Crook good morning and joining my friends outside, where we parted with the little old lady, who gave us her blessing with great ceremony and renewed her assurance of yesterday in reference to her intention of settling estates on Ada and me. Before we finally turned out of those lanes, we looked back and saw Mr. Crook standing at his shop door, in his spectacles, looking after us, with his cat upon his shoulder, and her tail sticking up on one side of his hairy cap like a tall feather. Quite an adventure for a morning in London said Richard with a sigh. Ah, cousin, cousin, it's a weary word this chancery. 
it is to me, and has been ever since I can remember, returned Ada. I am grieved that I should be the enemy as I suppose I am. Of a great number of relations and others, and that they should be my enemies as I suppose they are and that we should all be ruining one another without knowing how or why and be in constant doubt and discord all our lives. It seems very strange, as there must be right somewhere, that an honest judge in real earnest has not been able to find out through all these years where it is. Ah, cousin, said Richard. Strange, indeed. All this wasteful, Wanton chess playing is very strange. To see that composed court yesterday jogging on so serenely and to think of the wretchedness of the pieces on the board gave me the headache and the heartache both together. My head ached with wondering how it happened, if men were neither fools nor rascals, and my heart ached to think they could possibly be either. But at all events, Ada I may call you Ada. Of course you may, Cousin Richard. At all events, Chancery will work none of its bad influences on U.S. We have happily been brought together, thanks to our good kinsmen, and it can't divide us now. Never, I hope, Cousin Richard, said Ada gently. Miss Jellyby gave my arm a squeeze and me a very significant look. I smiled in return, and we made the rest of the way back very pleasantly. In half an hour after our arrival, M.R.S. Jellyby appeared, and in the course of an hour the various things necessary for breakfast straggled one by one into the dining room. I do not doubt that M.R.S. Jellyby had gone to bed and got up in the usual manner, but she presented no appearance of having changed her dress. She was greatly occupied during breakfast, for the morning's post brought a heavy correspondence relative to Boreo Bulaga, which would occasion her, she said to pass a busy day. The children tumbled about, and notched memoranda of their accidents in their legs, which were perfect little calendars of distress, and Peepy was lost for an hour and a half, and brought home from Newgate Market by a policeman. The equable manner in which M.R.S. Jellyby sustained both his absence and his restoration to the family circle surprised us all. She was by that time perseveringly dictating to Caddy, and Caddy was fast relapsing into the inky condition in which we had found her. At one o'clock an open carriage arrived for us, and a cart for our luggage. M.R.S. Jellyby charged us with many remembrances to her good friend Mr. Yarndis, Caddy left her desk to see us depart, kissed me in the passage, and stood biting her pen and sobbing on the steps, Peepy, I am happy to say, was asleep and spared the pain of separation, I was not without misgivings that he had gone to Newgate Market in search of me, and all the other children got up behind the barouche and fell off, and we saw them, with great concern, scattered over the surface of Thavies Inn as we rolled out of its precincts. Chapter 6 Quite at home the day had brightened very much, and still brightened as we went westward. We went our way through the sunshine and the fresh air wondering more and more at the extent of the streets, the brilliancy of the shops, the great traffic, and the crowds of people whom the pleasanter weather seemed to have brought out like many colored flowers. By and by we began to leave the wonderful city and to proceed through suburbs which, of themselves, would have made a pretty large town in my eyes, and at last we got into a real country road again, with windmills, rickyards, milestones, Farmers' wagons, scents of old hay, swinging signs, and horse troughs. Trees, fields, and hedgerows. It was delightful to see the green landscape before us and the immense metropolis behind, and when a wagon with a train of beautiful horses, furnished with red trappings and clear sounding bells, came by us with its music, I believe we could all three have sung to the bells, so cheerful were the influences around. The whole road has been reminding me of my namesake Whittington, said Richard, and that wagon is the finishing touch. Hello. What's the matter? We had stopped, and the wagon had stopped too. Its music changed as the horses came to a stand, and subsided to a gentle tinkling, 
except when a horse tossed his head or shook himself and sprinkled off a little shower of bell ringing. Our postillion is looking after the wagoner, said Richard, and the wagoner is coming back after us. Good day, friend. The wagoner was at our coach door. Why, here's an extraordinary thing, added Richard, looking closely at the man. He has got your name, Ada, in his hat. He had all our names in his hat. Tucked within the band were three small notes one addressed to Ada, one to Richard, one to me. These the wagoner delivered to each of us respectively, reading the name aloud first. In answer to Richard's inquiry from whom they came, he briefly answered, Master, Sir, if you please, and putting on his hat again, which was like a soft bowl, cracked his whip, reawakened his music, and went melodiously away. Is that Mr. Yarndus's wagon, said Richard, calling to our post boy. Yes, sir, he replied. Going to London. We opened the notes. Each was a counterpart of the other and contained these words in a solid, plain hand. I look forward, my dear, to our meeting easily and without constraint on either side. I therefore have to propose that we meet as old friends and take the past for granted. It will be a relief to you possibly, and to me certainly, and so my love to you. John Yarndis I had perhaps less reason to be surprised than either of my companions, having never yet enjoyed an opportunity of thanking one who had been my benefactor and sole earthly dependence through so many years. I had not considered how I could thank him, my gratitude lying too deep in my heart for that, but I now began to consider how I could meet him without thanking him, and felt it would be very difficult indeed. The notes revived in Richard and Ada a general impression that they both had, without quite knowing how they came by it, that their cousin Yarndis could never bear acknowledgments for any kindness he performed and that sooner than receive any he would resort to the most singular expedients and evasions or would even run away. Ada dimly remembered to have heard her mother tell, when she was a very little child, that he had once done her an act of uncommon generosity and that on her going to his house to thank him, he happened to see her through a window coming to the door, and immediately escaped by the back gate, and was not heard of for three months. This discourse led to a great deal more on the same theme, and indeed it lasted us all day, and we talked of scarcely anything else. If we did by any chance diverge into another subject, we soon returned to this, and wondered what the house would be like, and when we should get there and whether we should see Mr. Yarndis as soon as we arrived or after a delay, and what he would say to us, and what we should say to him. All of which we wondered about, over and over again. The roads were very heavy for the horses, but the pathway was generally good, so we alighted and walked up all the hills, and liked it so well that we prolonged our walk on the level ground when we got to the top. At Barnet there were other horses waiting for us, but as they had only just been fed, we had to wait for them too, and got a long fresh walk over a common and an old battlefield before the carriage came up. These delays so protracted the journey that the short day was spent and the long night had closed in before we came to St. Albans, near to which town Bleak House was, we knew. By that time we were so anxious and nervous that even Richard confessed, as we rattled over the stones of the old street to feeling an irrational desire to drive back again. As to Ada and me, whom he had wrapped up with great care, the night being sharp and frosty, we trembled from head to foot. When we turned out of the town, round a corner, and Richard told us that the postboy, who had for a long time sympathized with our heightened expectation, was looking back and nodding, we both stood up in the carriage. Richard holding Ada lest she should be jolted down, and gazed round upon the open country and the starlight night for our destination. There was a light sparkling on the top of a hill before us, and the driver, pointing to it with his whip and crying, that's Bleak House, put his horses into a canter and took us forward at such a rate, uphill though it was, that the wheels sent the road drift flying about our heads like spray from a water mill. 
Presently we lost the light, presently saw it, presently lost it, presently saw it, and turned into an avenue of trees and cantered up towards where it was beaming brightly. It was in a window of what seemed to be an old-fashioned house with three peaks in the roof in front and a circular sweep leading to the porch. A bell was rung as we drew up, and amidst the sound of its deep voice in the still air, and the distant barking of some dogs, and a gush of light from the opened door, and the smoking and steaming of the heated horses, and the quickened beating of our own hearts, we alighted in no inconsiderable confusion. Ada, my love, Esther, my dear, you are welcome. I rejoice to see you. Rick, if I had a hand to spare at present, I would give it you. The gentleman who said these words in a clear, bright, hospitable voice had one of his arms round Ada's waist and the other round mine, and kissed us both in a fatherly way, and bore us across the hall into a ruddy little room, all in a glow with a blazing fire. Here he kissed us again, and opening his arms, made us sit down side by side on a sofa ready drawn out near the hearth. I felt that if we had been at all demonstrative, he would have run away in a moment. Now, Rick, said he. I have a hand at liberty. A word in earnest is as good as a speech. I am heartily glad to see you. You are at home. Warm yourself. Richard shook him by both hands with an intuitive mixture of respect and frankness, and only saying, though with an earnestness that rather alarmed me, I was so afraid of Mr. Yarndus suddenly disappearing, you are very kind, sir. We are very much obliged to you, laid aside his hat and coat and came up to the fire. And how did you like the ride? And how did you like M.R.S. Jellyby, my dear? said Mr. Yarndus to Ada. While Ada was speaking to him in reply, I glanced, I need not say with how much interest, at his face. It was a handsome, lively, quick face, full of change and motion, and his hair was a silvered iron grey. I took him to be nearer sixty than fifty, but he was upright, hearty, and robust. From the moment of his first speaking to us his voice had connected itself with an association in my mind that I could not define, but now, all at once, a something sudden in his manner and a pleasant expression in his eyes recalled the gentleman in the stagecoach six years ago on the memorable day of my journey to reading. I was certain it was he. I never was so frightened in my life as when I made the discovery, for he caught my glance, and appearing to read my thoughts gave such a look at the door that I thought we had lost him. However, I am happy to say he remained where he was, and asked me what I thought of M.R.S. Jellyby. She exerts herself very much for Africa, sir, I said. Nobly, returned Mr. Yarndus. But you answer like Ada. Whom I had not heard. You all think something else, I see. We rather thought, said I, glancing at Richard and Ada, who entreated me with their eyes to speak, that perhaps she was a little unmindful of her home. Floored, cried Mr. Yarndus. I was rather alarmed again. Well, I want to know your real thoughts, my dear. I may have sent you there on purpose. We thought that, perhaps, said I, hesitating. It is right to begin with the obligations of home, sir, and that, perhaps, while those are overlooked and neglected, no other duties can possibly be substituted for them. The little jellabies, said Richard, coming to my relief, are really I can't help expressing myself strongly, sir in a devil of a state. She means well, said Mr. Yarndus hastily. The winds in the east. It was in the north, sir, as we came down, observed Richard. My dear Rick, said Mr. Yarndus, poking the fire, I'll take an oath it's either in the east or going to be. I am always conscious of an uncomfortable sensation now and then when the wind is blowing in the east. Rheumatism, sir, said Richard. I dare say it is, Rick. I believe it is. And so the little gel. 
I had my doubts about mRNAO, Lord, yes, it's easterly, said Mr. Yarndis. He had taken two or three undecided turns up and down while uttering these broken sentences, retaining the poker in one hand and rubbing his hair with the other, with a good-natured vexation at once so whimsical and so lovable that I am sure we were more delighted with him than we could possibly have expressed in any words. He gave an arm to Ada and an arm to me, and bidding Richard bring a candle, was leading the way out when he suddenly turned us all back again. Those little jellabies! Couldn't you didn't tea you now, if it had rained sugar plums, or three-cornered raspberry tarts, or anything of that sort, said Mr. Yarndis. Oh, Cousin Ada hastily began. Good, my pretty pet. I like Cousin. Cousin John, perhaps, is better. Then, Cousin John Ada laughingly began again. Ha, ha. Very good indeed said Mr. Yarndis with great enjoyment. Sounds uncommonly natural. Yes, my dear. It did better than that. It rained Esther. I, said Mr. Yarndis. What did Esther do? Why, Cousin John, said Ada, clasping her hands upon his arm and shaking her head at me across him for I wanted her to be quiet Esther was their friend directly. Esther nursed them, coaxed them to sleep, washed and dressed them, told them stories, kept them quiet, bought them keepsakes my dear girl. I had only gone out with Peepy after he was found and given him a little, tiny horse, Dash Ann, Cousin John, she softened poor Caroline, the eldest one, so much and was so thoughtful for me and so amiable. No, no, I won't be contradicted. Esther dear. You know, you know, it's true. The warm-hearted darling leaned across her cousin John and kissed me, and then looking up in his face, boldly said, at all events, cousin John, I will thank you for the companion you have given me. I felt as if she challenged him to run away. But he didn't. Where did you say the wind was, Rick? asked Mr. Yarndis. In the north as we came down, sir. You are right. There's no east in it. A mistake of mine. Come, girls, come and see your home. It was one of those delightfully irregular houses where you go up and down steps out of one room into another, and where you come upon more rooms when you think you have seen all there are, and where there is a bountiful provision of little halls and passages and where you find still older cottage rooms in unexpected places with lattice windows and green growth pressing through them. Mine, which we entered first, was of this kind, with an up and down roof that had more corners in it than I ever counted afterwards and a chimney, there was a wood fire on the hearth, paved all around with pure white tiles, in every one of which a bright miniature of the fire was blazing. Out of this room, you went down two steps into a charming little sitting room looking down upon a flower garden, which room was henceforth to belong to Ada and me. Out of this you went up three steps into Ada's bedroom, which had a fine broad window commanding a beautiful view, we saw a great expanse of darkness lying underneath the stars, to which there was a hollow window seat, in which, with a spring lock, three dear Adas might have been lost at once. Out of this room you passed into a little gallery, with which the other best rooms, only two, communicated, and so, by a little staircase of shallow steps with a number of corner stairs in it, considering its length, down into the hall. But if instead of going out at Ada's door you came back into my room, and went out at the door by which you had entered it, and turned up a few crooked steps that branched off in an unexpected manner from the stairs, you lost yourself in passages, with mangles in them, and three-cornered tables, and a native Hindu chair, which was also a sofa, a box, and a bedstead, and looked in every form something between a bamboo skeleton and a great birdcage, and had been brought from India nobody knew by whom or when. From these you came on Richard's room, which was part library, 
part sitting room, part bedroom, and seemed indeed a comfortable compound of many rooms. Out of that you went straight, with a little interval of passage, to the plain room where Mr. Yarndis slept, all the year round, with his window open, his bedstead without any furniture standing in the middle of the floor for more air, and his cold bath gaping for him in a smaller room adjoining. Out of that you came into another passage, where there were backstairs and where you could hear the horses being rubbed down outside the stable and being told to hold up and get over, as they slipped about very much on the uneven stones. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.